So we are ready for the webinar. Good afternoon from cold but sunny Vancouver, Canada. We have a very special webinar today, number 11, from time we started in October. And we have four international panelists and moderator. I would like to welcome uh, all of you on the screen. Uh, Rob Bates from New York, Gary Holloway in Melbourne, Australia, Michael Schlamander, Schlamadinger from Sorovsky in Austria, yeah. Vatens, Sean Moore in uh, US, Midwest, and then Scott in New York. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming uh, to this important webinar. So we will introduce them properly a little bit later. Uh, this is very, very international, uh, four countries, uh, three continents, five time zones. And uh, we are talking about future of natural and laboratory grown diamonds. Just to remind you, uh, with Dushan Simic, uh, co-author of our book, Laboratory Grown Diamonds, since October 15, we presented 10 webinars. We want to do it up to December. We added two more in, in January, two more in February. So now we're rounding up everything with the number 11. Our guests were Malay Harani, civil engineer, as well as scientist Boris Fegelson, who learn, teach us how to grow diamonds with the CVD and HPHT method. Then we have uh, dealers like Top Chatham, uh, manufacturers, uh, Algodanza, Frank Ripka, and gemologists uh, uh, like Dushan Simic, uh, analytical gemology and jewelry, uh, Sherry Woodring, GKL, myself from Canadian Gemological Laboratory. And then we added a, a panelist uh, and uh, journalist and dealers, wholesalers, uh, can live grow diamonds and natural diamonds coexist? It was quite popular. Uh, so we added another uh, round table from CVD factory to the market. That was really from the factory in New Jersey, US technology, and from the cutting factory in India. And uh, we have a lot of uh, Indian uh, manufacturers and uh, uh, marketers. And then all of them, you can watch on our channel, Branko James and A, G and J. And thank you for those who are already watching us on YouTube channel, we are live. Uh, you can also text uh, questions if you want uh, later. I will encourage you to ask questions during the presentations and to a QA uh, button on the bottom to avoid chatting if it's possible. This book won't be possible without uh, great co authors uh, uh, like Boris Figleston, Sherry Woodring, Malay Hirani, and Frank Ripka. Altogether, we, they wrote from five to 25 pages of different topics. Antoinette Metlens, uh, who is our special guest uh, uh, tonight, she'll join us uh, later, was reviewing the book together with Richard Drucker and Stuart Robertson from Gu Gem Guide magazine. Technical review by Alberto Scarani, Maggi Labs, Italy. Uh, dealers in Lashesh, Tom Chatham, gave us these nice diamonds for the photo for the top uh, page and a lot of samples for research. God and Muton Gonzalez were uh, designing the book based on previous edition, 2007. Uh, but we added 100 more pages. And Nesha Popovich, our countryman, was uh, responsible for uh, collecting your names and organizing these webinars. And the gold sponsors, we're always looking for sponsors here for next books uh, in case you're interested. But gold sponsor for this edition was NCJV Australia. Many thanks for Kim Hughes. A lot of people watching us in Australia now. There is a show going on there. And the, at the end, who stays, I will give you a special present from me and Dushan. You can watch one hour video movie that you made specially for this show in Australia. Serious sponsor, NGA, Gail Brett Levin. You can order books from NGA if you are a member or if you're in Australia, please order from Kim Hughes, NCJV. They distribute in Australia and in England is JVA. Uh, Shirley Mitchell was our uh, supporter as well. We are selling on our website, uh, brancogen.com books. And the book is about everything what you can imagine from background on uh, science, on the diamond, diamond types to technology, growers, and of course, biggest part is identification. And we talk about certification and tracking with the patents and the how to detect fraudulent replicas. What you can take out of this? Today, we have a lot of retailers, a lot of jewelers uh, joining us because we have great uh, uh, guests. If you can use standard instruments like microscope, loop, UV fluorescence, and cross polarized filters and train how to use it without a lot of pictures in a book, without a lot of information we're giving you for webinars, then you can be better uh, prepared to separate these two categories and be more confident. This is a message for me, Dushan, about what you can do with this book. It's intermediate level. We can talk, of course, 
on more uh, topics and we can go another level. We are doing this. We already finished 80% of our fourth edition. Uh, I'm the leader uh, of, the, of the book, but we divided uh, uh, this in two blocks. Dushan will do fifth edition on instruments. I will do fourth edition on uh, more on science and uh, practical uh, portable instruments. We have famous names like Dr. Aaron Collins from England, uh, Dr. Zaitsev from University of New York. He's still teaching uh, diamonds in New York. John Shepard is editor and uh, instrument maker. Tejin Lu from NGTC, uh, China, biggest lab in China. Uh, Thomas Henschwag from uh, GGTL, uh, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Dr. Victor Vince. Each of them write one chapter, big one, and uh, we'll review it uh, uh, by end of the summer. It should be out. Uh, Dushan Simic and Miko Armstrong are uh, technical review, and uh, each of these will be presented uh, in April in webinars. Let me now introduce our moderator. Uh, uh, Ro Bates, uh, who is a journalist for over 25 years, uh, mostly as editor of JCK magazine, last 20 years. His blog, uh, Cutting Remarks, uh, has won two Hez and Neil awards for American business media. He also won five edits for Folio magazine, American Business Society prestigious Triple Zero Award, Jewelers of America Gem Award, and uh, Jewelers Security Alliance and Industry Service Award. Uh, this is all, uh, he is quite known, whoever comes to Jessica's show in Las Vegas or any major events, you, you, you probably know Rob Bates. And uh, I will now basically uh, turn uh, to Rob, and of course uh, there's a book, uh, he just came out, Murder is Forever, and I'll be very uh, curious and happy to read it uh, soon, Rob. So tell us more about uh, what you're doing, and uh, please introduce uh, our first uh, uh, panelist. Okay, well thank you very much, Ronco, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everybody for turning, tuning in. We have an awesome uh, panel. Uh, we have people from manufacturing, from retailing. We have expert gemologists. So uh, I think we're going to get a lot of ground covered. And um, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. Uh, I've been asked uh, not to necessarily, uh, you know, to dissuade people from chatting because it tends to uh, distract from everyone. Uh, but you know, we want to have this be very, once the panelists uh, get done speaking, we want this to be very participatory. So, you know, feel free to ask a lot of questions and we'll all try to get them answered as much as possible. Um, and uh, as long as, uh, here's my book. Uh, it's a novel, it's a mystery novel. It's a fun thing. It's uh, industry related, but it's, hopefully it's not homework necessarily. It's just trying to be fun. So. Um, with that said, uh, let me introduce our first panelist, uh, Mr. Gary Holloway, an old friend of mine from uh, Down Under. Am I, am I allowed to say Down Under? Is that okay? Can I say Down Under? That's, that's certainly okay. can, Rob. You certainly okay. can. There you yeah. go. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm over. So there you go. Um, Gary is a well-known uh, gem expert. He has a BS in applied geology and gemology. Um, and uh, diamond diplomas from the, I guess, the Gemological Association of Australia, correct? Correct. Uh, for 20 years, he's been actively educating consumers with a focus on cut quality and as director of PriceScope, uh, where Holloway Cut Advisor HCA and Looks Like Diamond sites uh, are hosted. He has a whole bunch of patents on lining for diamonds. Um, he's done a lot of great work on cut. And he also runs two, on top of all this, he runs two jewelry stores, uh, which he founded in 1976. And he has a little PowerPoint. Uh, and oh, 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 and I, I forgot to mention, uh, we're gonna, we want the panelists in general to talk about how they got into lab grown, what their thoughts is and where they see the category going. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Gary. Hello, and thank you very much, Rob. <clears throat> so, um, Rob, one of the questions that um, I've been told to answer is uh, why am I selling lab grown diamonds? And I'm not selling lab grown diamonds. And the reason is that I think that there's going to be a really stronger market for natural diamonds. I'm in the German car market. I sell to people who mostly drive German cars, not Kias, not Toyotas. So, <clears throat> I'm going to prove why natural diamonds are going to become more valuable. And the reason simply is that, <clears throat> whoops, the reason simply is that 
I can prove that lab-grown diamonds of the CVD variety sparkle more. So there's going to be less cheap natural diamonds sold because when people look at natural diamonds and in the, in the mall stores, the cheap diamonds are going to be outsold by the lab grown. So half the mine's value is in those cheap diamonds. So there's going to be no prospecting and no investment and fewer new mines. So real diamonds are going to become rarer. So cut quality depends on the shape of the rough diamond. So natural diamonds are usually sawn into two or more diamonds and they cut the diamonds as deeply as they possibly can to get the best yield from the rough. In the case of HBD diamonds, they are also cut too deeply, but usually a single stone from each one of those crystals. Chemical vapor deposition diamonds, on the other hand, tend to be grown to be just thick enough to be cut to whatever you need in order to fulfill your orders. So in the case of a one carat round diamond, you're going to be cutting to about 3.85, 3.9 millimetre, which is just going to get you a nice one carat diamond. There's no point in growing to four millimetres, which is about the depth of most one carat round diamonds of natural origin. So this is how the systems work. <clears throat> GIA's cut grade has helped it to become by far the largest organisation in terms of the value of diamonds and the quantity of diamonds that are graded in any lab. They've taken that mantle from IGA. So first of all, the lab scans the diamond and they get these very complicated reports with all sorts of very, very accurate information. The proportions are entered into Assetware, which is their trademarked software, and you get these charts. So this chart that you can see um, has the excellent cut in the centre, in the bright green, very good, then good, and then fair. So the shallow, steep um, uh, across the top for the crown angle, and it's upside down a little bit. Um, there's a historical reason if anybody wants to ask me a question why they have made the graph upside down. Um, so in, in, in effect, what happens is that the heaviest diamonds are in the lower right corner and the lightest diamonds, but their given carat weight, are in the upper left side. Most CVD diamonds, of course, because of the nature of the rough, are cut to the shallow end and most natural diamonds are pushed for yield to get the highest possible yield. Now, what I'm going to show you is that Holloway Cut Advisor, which was the first cut grading system that really works, um, it was six years before GIAs and five years before AGSs, which is also a far superior system. Now, Later on, that little dot that I've just popped on the screen, the little red dot, I'm going to talk about a diamond that, that actually achieves that upgrade of excellent from GIA. Now, <clears throat> um, if you make note of that uh, free offer, $50 free offer, what I'm going to show you is that one quarter of a very large number of natural diamonds, round diamonds, only one quarter get my excellent cut grade, as opposed to well over half of all of the diamonds that are submitted to GAA get their excellent cut grade or their triple excellent grade. Lab grown diamonds, on the other hand, again, from a very large database, three quarters of them achieve my excellent cut grade. So what's going to happen is when people go into signets and sales, and they're looking at two diamonds side by side, they're going to see in that comparison, they're going to see that the lab-grown diamond sparkles more. Now, of course, it's probably also going to be a better colour and a better clarity because as time goes on, the quality of lab-grown diamonds is going to get better and better. The lower quality rough diamonds that are mined are going to stop selling. 
And because of that, there won't be any new mines because nobody's going to go out prospecting. I know this from my own certain investment in what is absolutely certain to be one of the best prospects in Australia. I've invested nearly $200,000 in this and it's gone nowhere because nobody else is going to, we're going to try and have an IPO, but it's not going to work. So there's going to be fewer diamond mines and the people who drive those luxury mark cars, the Porsches, the Mercedes, the BMWs, they're going to still want natural diamonds. And so natural price rises, natural prices are going to rise. So let's look at this concept. 90% of the value of all lab-grown diamonds at the moment, 90% of the value is now in CBD diamonds. HPD diamonds are only being grown for very small melee. CBD rough, as I've explained, is thinner than natural rough. And rough shape matters. If you think about tourmalines, they tend to be long rectangular stones. If you think about sapphires, they grow in barrel shapes. The barrel shapes tend to get cut into ovals and cushions. They don't get cut into emerald cuts. So the CVD depth is the, is the issue and the natural diamond is the width. So slightly shallow is better and slightly deeper is a disaster because you get leakage around the outside edge of the diamonds. If we look at this stone that I mentioned earlier, this is a 6.3 millimeter one carat diamond. An ideal cut 90 point is 6.3 and that diamond will look bigger and sparkle more than a one carat 6.3 because of the leakage at the outside edges. So when we look at this, this image from Hope Diamonds, um, if you think about what's done with the top of that diamond, in this case, you push it out to the maximum diameter of the diamond and the sawn off top will have a bigger table, it will be cut shallower and the CVD diamonds are being cut the same way. Are going to be very bright. They're going to really sparkle and sing in jewellery stores. So lab-grown diamonds, are they good or they're bad? I think they're good and I think there is definitely a place for them in the market. The lab-grown diamonds will rule at the mall stores. Natural diamonds will become more expensive over a decade or so because there will be less and less mines and already the mine production is dropping. The biggest risk that I see for lab-grown diamonds is that the marketing, the marketing I don't think is being honest at the moment. Lab-grown diamonds, and, and if, if the trade, if the press, um, if the media, if social media picks up on the fact that that marketing is not absolutely honest, um, I think that lab-grown diamonds are going to be facing a risk. Are they really better for the environment? Um, Conflict diamonds we know are coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo, but also 40% of the world's tantalum and 60% of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they are in your phone batteries. The tantalum gets exported out so that people don't have to pay the government or those people are being forced, um, forced labour by guerrilla groups. And at the moment, as you can see, most of the world's diamonds are CVD. 56% according to Bain are grown in Asia. I don't believe the US numbers. I think that, uh, that a lot of those US diamonds are actually being imported from other countries. Fossil fuels supply three quarters of the electricity in Asia. Fossil fuels are supplying two thirds of the world's time uh, electricity. Wind and solar are not reliable. You get graining if you get interruptions of power supply. And lab-grown diamonds growers, they're not building hydro schemes. Um, so if they take electricity from hydro schemes, they're stealing electricity that is otherwise being produced by fossil fuels. So to sum up, <clears throat> um, I'm offering this $50 one month free use of HCA, lab-grown diamonds. Um, 
you'll be able to get this after this presentation because I haven't set it up yet. And uh, that's it for me. And so now I have to stop sharing and I have to make Franco the boss. And make host. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you very a lot uh, uh, for this uh, insight uh, from cutting perspective and, and uh, retailer as well. So Rob, you can uh, continue with your uh, panel, please. All right. Uh, we're going to talk now with Dr. Michael Schlemdinger of Swarovski, one of the biggest, uh, most prestigious names in the, uh, in the business. Um, Michael has been with Swarovski since 1995. He is a trained mineralogist and gemologist who now specializes in sustainability. Um, and as a next step, he wants to fully evaluate the ecological impact of uh, man-made diamonds and focus on the energy consumption and the carbon footprint and ways to mitigate and improve that. And um, so, uh, Michael, I'd like to start off just by asking you um, how, why Swarovski got into lab-grown diamonds and what it's doing with it right now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you, Rob. Well, uh, our interest in, in the lab-grown diamonds started like something like 20 years ago. We looked into it. Seriously looking into it started like something around 2012. And since our company has expertise in man-made materials, crystal is our core business and cubic zirconia was for uh, Roski Gemstones uh, business, the bread and butter business. We saw that as an opportunity to extend our portfolio. So we started in 2016 with a market test with a Diama jewelry brand in the US. It was something like putting the toes in the water to probe it. It was fascinating back then to see how the category matured from a very immature erratic supply to an improving supply chain that developed and became more and more structured. Uh, you remember Shrey and Shah's uh, co cover, Rich of this, pretty much one month ago, where he also uh, really very well uh, could tell about that. We, we see that field as, a, field as a huge potential, so we can support what Gary uh, just mentioned. Our relation to natural diamond is a very positive one. Until recently, we also had some SKUs containing uh, natural diamonds. And for 25 years, I've, I was in procurement for colored gemstones. And uh, so we, we have a positive attitude towards mining. It was always important for us to make sure that the mining was done in the right way, though. So. so that's, that's basically uh, was our start in, into that field. Okay, and so uh, where do you see the market going? Um, what kind of reaction have you got to it? Where the big question is obviously what Gary brought up, uh, you know, where do you see prices going? And vis-a-vis um, -vis the natural, um, how are they reacting? Do you think it's taking part of the natural right now? Or how, how, how do you find selling them both at the same time? Well, the, the sector of uh, LG, uh, lab grown diamonds will, will grow further. They are here to stay. There's more players now than that used to be. More players will come in. And also, as Gary said, qualities are, have improved and are still improving. Sizes will become bigger. Uh, there's one thing though, the many producers, they, eye, they have, have a strong eye on other applications, mainly technological applications. And uh, some, some already say that margins in that sector are higher than in jewelry. And it, it may soon be that demand may outpace the current and future supply. It also strongly depends how that technologies will develop in the future. And as we heard from Gary's estimation that natural diamonds will become more rare and expensive. Uh, we, we also see that this is the alternative for people who like the look, appearance and feel of a diamond, but do not yet have the financial means to buy what they want in natural, especially when, as Gary said, prices will increase, then this is the alternative. And what we also see that two categories, uh, they, they need to complement each other. Two categories, I mean, the mine, natural diamonds and lab grown, they should complement 
each other rather than fight each other. And also for prices, of course, the more players, the development in processes will make prices go down further. Uh, if it could be that uh, sooner or later, the pegging to Rappaport, what happens now with percentages of rap, uh, may uh, soon be, uh, sometime be abandoned and we would rather see a linear flatter curve increase with size and no price jump at the break size. Because still uh, this, the, the, the price jumps of Rappaport, they influence cut quality. I remember two years ago, Gary gave a great talk on the, this issue in Cyprus that those diamonds that are close to the, to the break sizes always are of a not so good quality. This more or less happens sometimes in lab-grown too, but this could be overcome with that. But still, we don't see that the prices will deep dive. Uh, cost for rough will soften, but it's not to be seen that jewel grade diamonds can be grown and in a very inexpensive way in the near or mid future. And finally, the, cut, the cost for cutting and polishing is more or less the same as for natural diamonds. So with this in mind, lab-grown diamonds will keep at least some value, they will not, not drop down to nothing. And of course, when uh, natural diamond prices go up, of course, that's a different story. Okay, um, and you, you talked a little bit about uh, your background in sustainability and that's what you're focusing on. Um, there's now different sustainability certifications out there. And I, I think Swarovski is, is, is involved in, in the one from SES. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe you are. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about that and um, what role you see that playing? We are still there in, in, in collecting data. We are in exchange with uh, SES. Uh, Stanley will be uh, in the in the webinar next week. That's going to be very interesting. I think it's too early to really uh, make conclusions, but I uh, agree with Gary that this comparison, we are eco-friendly, I'm more eco-friendly than this one. It's, it, it's not a good one because uh, everybody has advantages and disadvantages and uh, what, what has to be happen, uh, has to happen, both sides have to mitigate and improve. This improvement is always necessary. Hundred percent. All right. Um, I think that's it. it unless you, uh, we'll move on. And uh, if people have any other questions, they can they can ask them later. Um, but thank okay. you very much, Michael. That was that was excellent. Thank you, and I really appreciate it. And now we're going to go on to uh, Mr. Dan Scott, another uh, good friend of mine. Um, Dan is the founder and brand architect with uh, Lux Licensing LLC, a uh, New York brand uh, and marketing agency. He's been nominated as a finalist for CMO of the year, and he's been honored as uh, one of America's top 500 CMOs. He's a contributing author to a bunch of publications, including Lab Grow Magazine, Rappaport, Jewelry Business, Solitaire, Stern Business, The CMO, Sun Council Circle, and Brand Week. And uh, he has a presentation on uh, marketing. So uh, take it away, Dan. I do, but thank you, Rob, for that a very uh, generous welcome. It's an honor to be with everyone today. Uh, some of the things that I may say are going to be controversial, uh, but they will be all based on facts as far as I may define facts as things that are credible and checked. Let's start with my history. I was really lucky. My first position was a QVC. QVC sold about 30% of jewelry at the time. It's since degraded significantly, but they sold diamond jewelry until Dominique came along. Dominique was a cubic zirconia that obviously fit that demographic. They bought the corporation. Things went downhill from there because it wasn't properly integrated. Remember this point as we move on through the deck. It's a very important point. This isn't about a QVC audience and trying to compare that audience to a, a, a cubic zirconia or a lab grown of any means. It's just showing you a similarity between Diamonds and Diamondique from a company that obviously is immensely successful worldwide. Um, now, uh, Bronco, these a slide should be timed. I'm not sure why uh, it's not advancing. So um, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the uh, to the next one, that would be great. Um, the other thing that I learned at QVC, I will say is about eight years there, was the ability to uh, to romance the jewelry properly. I mean, that that's really an expensive, but a very important point. History shouldn't be repeated. Rob did a phenomenal story. He summarizes certainly better than I can. But this is a very important point because I've relived more than Dominique and, 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 uh, and Diamond. 
when I was at Scott K for 10 years as CMO, we went through two horrific battles. Please hear me on this. There's so many comparisons. Do you remember when platinum fought against palladium? Not just in bridal, but in fashion. Unfortunately, neither one won. So too is the case with cobalt and tungsten, contemporary metals, very similar to diamond versus diamonds. Read the article, please, from uh, Rob. It'll summarize everything. Because I don't believe in diamonds versus diamonds. I believe in diamonds and diamonds. Now, I write for Lab Grown Diamond Magazine, so clearly I don't, but I don't have a propensity towards one or the other. I really am split. Here's the thing that we have to think about. If you were launching Lab Grown Diamonds today as a brand, as a, an entity, wouldn't you consider strategy and tactics and, and basically the four Ps of marketing, right? This is marketing 101, guys. Product, price, promotion, placement. None of these were considered. And it wasn't like we had weeks or months or even years. We had decades to prepare for this. But as an industry, we did not. And look at what is happening. First of all, we're in a price prison. We're locked in to wrap sheet prices and will always be lesser than in the world of lab grown, seen as that and priced as that. That's a big deal. If you launched a company today, would you price your, your, your price grades against your competitor and be forced to be lower than them constantly? Yeah, I don't think so. Other places with promotion and all, I will describe and prove to you are an issue. Now they're solvable issues, but they're issues. And they're real significant issues that impact retail, sellers, brokers, all the way to the consumer level. And again, I'm gonna show you why in just a moment. And by the way, I'll say now as a disclaimer, all the companies that I'm referencing, I have great respect for. I'm a member of most of them, but here's the example. Lob Ground Diamonds has right now one entity. There's another that we're not sure what's happening with them. And, and then the Diamond Foundry, which is a public company. I'm not sure how they could even form a nonprofit legally, but regardless they have, but there is one and, and it's run by a small group in the middle of America. In comparison, the natural diamond uh, sector worldwide Look at these names. There's five right here that, uh, that make up a, a conglomerate of power, money, influence, but only, only for natural diamonds. In fact, they won't take calls or talk about lab grown. Would you like some more? Well, here you go. Four more, and notice the bottom one, the US Jewelry Council is in, it's loaded with big, big players. And we're not even going to the local level like the New York Diamonds Club, but I'm not done yet you literally could possibly lose count of how many natural diamond groups are there to provide education, regulation, co-op dollars, and more. But find me one that is of any significance, that's not run by one or two people that nobody even can think of in the top of their head, that is you know, in another part of the world or, or in the US, you'd be hard pressed to find it if you'd find them at all. That's a problem, it's a big problem. Now, again, I'm not calling out these particular agencies, it's just what it's reality. Go to, to Jewelers Vigilance Committee, do a search for lab grown diamonds, do it with or without the hyphen, do it without the word diamond. Either way, you'll get results of zero, zero results. Maybe they're having a technical glitch, right? That's what I thought. So I went on to the other players to see if I was a consumer, if I was a retailer, broker, whatever, if I was interested in learning more about lab grown diamonds, the truth about lab grown diamonds, the truth about natural diamonds. Here's one reason why, I'm just gonna call it out. If you were being paid for your lunches and what, at events by the diamond, the, uh, the diamond council, they, they were called the, uh, the DPA, now they changed their name to the Natural Diamond Council, or any other company that specializes in natural diamonds, of course, there's gonna be a propensity. Now to J uh, Jewelers Vigilance Committee credit, their credit, they have understanding the FTC guidelines. It's free. I highly recommend you to get this. It speaks to the vernacular. It speaks to the legalese. And it's something we have to follow. Jewelers of America, do a search. You'll find something from 2019. Congratulations, by the way, on doing something in 2019. I'd love to see a follow-up. On their guide to buying diamonds, there's not a word that I could see. One lab grown. It was all based on natural. That's confusing to me. The last thing we need is clutter and confusion. Okay, another group, George Board of Trade. When you do a search, you get zero results. Again, could be technical glitches. Maybe they're gonna load them in the future. It's been a few years now. I would think that there would be more robust information, but guess what? No, 
Can I tell you a story about leaders? I believe that leaders, the respected leaders, and I'm not telling you I'm talking about an individual, but groups. We are in, when I say we, I'm including myself now on the lab grown side, even though I clearly love both and I write about both and I support both. And if I had to choose, it would have to be natural, to be honest with you. But for the love of God, it's it, diamonds regardless. It's not diamonds versus diamonds, it's diamonds. Leaders, great leaders, protect their group. Did you know that if you try to join a natural diamond group and you had only your producer for lab grown, even if you tried to pay, you may not get in. That's what I've heard from three people. They didn't get in. Women's Jewelry Association, upcoming. They've got an event, April 15th. That's great. The only one. But it's, at least they're trying. They've got something. Here's another group, right? The Diamond Manufacturers and Imports Importers Association. They've got something that's a bit outdated. I think it's from 2018. You're starting to get the idea here, right? There's no group to help lab-grown diamond producers, the retailers, where's the education modules? Where is the co-op dollars? Where's the help with regulation? And where's the division of, of any of these crossover groups? Even GIA, type in, I welcome you to do this. Lab-grown diamonds, you'll find there's a report from 2018 pops up right at the top. That's it. Now, there may be other things in their site, but if you do a general search in the search bar, that's the way it should work, right? It's supposed to pull all the information that has lab-grown or lab-grown diamonds in the text. So either everybody's site is screwed up or something else is screwed up. The pros and cons of natural. Natural, number one, the word. How what a beautiful word. It is the only thing that differentiates natural mined diamonds from that that is man-made. And they, need, they are using it. But it also goes in lockstep with bridal. So I have a propensity to look at bridal and natural diamonds. And I'll tell you why. Don't get mad with me, uh, lab-grown diamond people. I'll prove that your margins will be even greater and your sales will be stronger as well. History, Hollywood. I'm out from Marilyn Monroe to, you know, where you Rihanna. Today, Rihanna. There's tons and tons of history to pull from. But here's a big point. And this is, if I can just leave you with anything, please hear me on this. The Natural Diamond Council, which speaks to consumers, is saying that diamonds are rare. And I take it back. They're, they're going one step further. They're saying that they're saying natural diamonds are extremely rare. Now, can we just, for the record, I mean, I, I don't mean to be pedestrian on this, but for the record, can we look up what the definition of rare is? Rare is, and I'll read it right from the screen, it's seldom found seldom occurring or found. There's a place in Arkansas, it's called Diamond Park. You can pick diamonds up from the ground. Now they're not gem quality diamonds, but they're coming out of asteroids from the sky. They're, they're, they're combing the seabeds, De Beers's, to get unbelievable amounts. And then if you look hard at the numbers of the actual mines, here's six examples, you'll see that millions upon millions, 175.56 million carats in 2018. And those numbers keep multiplying. Does that sound rare to you? Or does it sound scarce? Because mines are closing. The gem quality of what they're pulling out is lessened, but they are not disclaiming white diamonds or, or if they would say colored diamonds or fancy diamonds are rare, I wouldn't say a word because they're right. But they're saying diamonds and they're only showing white and that leads to confusion and it leads to what is an untruth, frankly speaking. I can't find any a defense for it. All I'm seeing is just the opposite. I know Canada has issues, but Canada has mines. We have untapped mines. There's new veins that they're finding in, in, in different parts of the world to find other diamonds. <sighs> diamonds are not rare, and they're certainly not extremely rare. I wrote about this, by the way, in Lab Grown Diamond. You can go to labgrownmagazine.com. Uh, You'll see all my, I do a feature story every month. And, and, and Bruce Cleaver, the CEO himself said, with this investment, meaning the seabed activity they're doing with the boats, we will be able to optimize new technology to find and recover diamonds more efficiently to meet consumer demand across the globe. These aren't my words. They're the CEOs of De Beers. Lab-grown pros. Uh, now we're talking about just lab-grown. Color, leverage color. You won't have to worry about price. There's no comparison. You can't have a red diamond. You can set your price for a natural red diamond, but you certainly can produce them. They're all custom made. If you buy custom clothing, you can't return it. It's custom. Mm -hmm. Three is the type. Every single CVD diamond we produce is a type 2A diamond, one of the most rare in the world. Now you could debate all of this, if, you know, well, that's just marketing speak. Well, it's being certified as a type 2A diamond. 
Okay, the CERT may be different. It's gonna be digital versus paper, another story. But we need to control this as a group or the leaders have to help and shape this because the virgin diamond concept could be another great selling tool for them. But people are going to quote Patrick Milam, it's the wild, wild west, the VP of Ritani. He is, he's saying it's just, it's a free for all. And people are, are writing their own rules, which is problematic, especially when the federal government is saying, look, here's the words to use, here's what you should be following. And I don't think people are trying to break the rules. I think they're confused. And without a group, without a leader, we're still confused. And perhaps that's the way the natural diamond group would like it. Perhaps. I'm not trying to set out controversy and, and you know, false uh, information. It's the last thing I want to do. I'm about transparency and I'm about honesty. And I really, truly, I have no stake or equity in lab grown magazine. I write for them because I want to write for them. I like to write for them. I get paid. That's nice. I do a lot of other things. I've, I've supported natural and I will continue to, but we're in trouble. Diamonds are forever. Diamonds are forever in trouble. Unless we as a group together, everyone listening to me, please, beyond this wonderful panel I've been honored to be on, consider what I'm saying because I have lived it at least twice, platinum and palladium, cobalt versus tungsten, all the FTC investigations. We came out, we won. We didn't win. Titanium won. The lawyers won. Can we learn from that? Please, could you imagine if diamond demand sunk? And it very well could, because it was nothing more than a great marketing campaign, one of the world's largest and best marketing campaigns possibly ever by NW Air back in the day. But Diamonds Are Forever is not presently being broadcast as a entity, you know, it's owned now by, I believe it's forever, Mark. Regardless, the point is you're not seeing that thing. And to Rob Bates' point earlier in the webcast, people aren't at home just thinking about diamonds. They're just not, right? Uh, uh, Bronco, if, if I could ask you just advance for some reason, the slide didn't uh, move on and I need to keep to my 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, it was very well, interesting. It, it, I, I, I just have one, a couple other closing points if you could just advance the slide. It, I just, for some reason it didn't, advance, I'll, I'll make it very brief. Okay. Uh, by the way, I just want to thank uh, Dan for making this first uh, promo slide. It was a uh, wonderful and video for our uh, social media. Yeah, and it's something I, I'm, I'm honored to do actually to help. Um, and, and I will keep it short and prompt. I might have to ask you to advance this for some reason. We've kind of covered this market saturation, I think is around the corner. It, it's happened in multiple industries. It happened in the fashion industry with, with faux fur, you know, and it disrupted everything. Now faux fur might not be biodegradable. Uh-oh, <laughs> problem, right? Even recycled goods on fur. There's so many industries to compare this to. So what are the immediate lab room diamond needs? This is my closing slide next to the last one, which will have my, my information to contact me, which I welcome conversation on this. First of all, please, we have to have a meeting of the minds. This webinar, I applaud Bronco for having the courage to be doing this, but it's a step in the right direction. It's not the ladder we have to climb. It's one step of it. We need a global steering committee, one that is not just focused on natural. We need a shared and agreed plan, a budget, just like you'd launch anything. And we need constant, clear communicate. We need communication that is honest and real, not that natural diamonds are extremely rare. I mean, come on now. Can anyone with all honesty look somebody in the eye and tell them that? Well, that's what the Natural Diamond Council is saying. I'm not against slapping anybody. I'm just confused, really confused. <sighs> diamonds versus diamonds shouldn't be on the table. It should just be, it shouldn't even be diamonds and diamonds. It should be diamonds. They're diamonds, okay? If we don't decide, the consumer will. And that could be sooner than later. My information's at the bottom. Thank you for allowing me to express my views. All right. Thank you, Dan. That's a provocative and interesting uh, conversation. We've gotten um, some chat comments, some um, uh, interesting questions, at least one interesting question from Michael. We're going to get to that uh, right at the end after we uh, hear from one or two more speakers, and then we'll uh, get to all the the questions in the chat and everything else. Uh, coming up next is Mr. Sean Moore. He's the director of sales at Borsheim's uh, Fine Jewelry and Gifts in Omaha, Nebraska. 
probably one of the most uh, prestigious independent jewelers in the United States. Uh, it's part of Warren Buffett's uh, Berkshire Hathaway family of uh, companies. And Sean is a graduate gemologist. Uh, he's been with Borsheim's almost 30 years. So almost as long as I've been doing this, he has uh, been in sales as a diamond buyer. His uh, expertise in the jewelry industry has led him to serve on a lot of the industry boards, a lot of those uh, organizations that uh, Dan talked about, NCDIA, Luxury, and Centurion. So, uh, Sean, to start it off, I guess, just tell me about uh, Borsheim's experience with Lab Grown Diamonds, why you got into it, and how it's going. Hello, everybody, and thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, you know, Borsheim's uh, has been selling uh, earth mined diamonds since we started in business 150 years ago. Um, but we had we had a, an entry into the lab grown market in 2016, um, where uh, where we entered with uh, Diama Swarovski in a fashion in a in a fashion category and Alter, uh, where we uh, started with loose uh, studs, bracelets, some core categories, and 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 bridal. And it was a fairly easy entry for us. Uh, it was an easy decision uh, to, to want to carry the product because we, we started carrying Clarity Enhanced Goods in the mid 1990s. And we actually were a test market for the Bellaterre product, the HTHP Bellaterre product in the, in the mid 2000s. And we started with uh, discussions with Apollo and Genesis uh, in the, in the, uh, also around the same time, the end of uh, you know, 20, 2008 to 2013, somewhere in there. Um, and we were also uh, at all the GIM, GIA symposiums in the war rooms. We were active in, in uh, all those discussions about clarity enhanced goods, uh, lab grown goods. And, uh, and so we, we were well versed in those, in those categories and those issues. Um, and we knew we, uh, as, as, as retailers, we wanted to actually carry the product and offer the product to our consumers because that's what that's what our history was. Um, but we had some big questions about uh, the lab grown product uh, that we had to answer, and um, those those questions were: Was there going to be a significant consumer demand? Um, was there going to be um, uh, were there going to be options for for the consumer, uh, or uh, and was the supply chain going to be ethical and transparent? Because as we had seen with Clarity Enhanced and even the beginning of of lab grown, there didn't seem to be ethical and transparent uh, offerings. Uh, lots of hidden, uh, hidden goods. Lots of lots of problems. And so, we, did we want to enter into this uh, into this this hot topic and, and not be doing it right? Um, but of course, that's why we chose Diama, and that's why we chose Alter, uh, two companies who were forthcoming. They were honest. They were ethical. And and by the way, they they were willing not only to educate our staff, but they were willing to educate uh, the consumer. And we found that to be extremely attractive. And so we partnered with those two companies. Um, and then the big questions we also had, uh, more importantly, are we providing our consumer with good value? It's one thing that we've, for years, we've, you know, we, we, we pledge customer service. Uh, we pledge um, a substantial offering. There's plenty of depth, depth and breadth and we'll, we'll offer you anything. But one of the things we hang our hat on is, is providing good value. And so were we gonna be able to provide good value on uh, lab-grown diamonds, and more importantly, was the price and uh, supply volatility going to hurt us if we start carrying the product and then find out that the price or or the supply uh, dries up? And if the, these diamonds become a dime a dozen and we sold them for thousands of dollars, what kind of trouble are we in? And more importantly, what have we done to our, our consumers that we love and want to keep shopping with us? Um, and then one of our, our one of our big internal problems was mix-ups. How are we going to handle lab-grown goods, and ha handle earth-mined goods, and not screw this up? Um, but we did it. We've been carrying it since 2016, and what we know now is the consumer awareness and consumer acceptance is somewhere probably between 70 and 80 percent. Uh, with the younger with the younger demographic, certainly more accepting. Uh, the the older demographic is a little more skeptical and hesitant. Um, and then I think that plays into uh, into the comments about uh, when Gary said his his clients drive you know German cars and want natural natural earth mined diamonds. I mean I, we also see a similar a similar trend. Uh, though you know the rich are rich and they can afford to buy 
an earth mine diamond and they actually aspire to have the earth mine diamond. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not willing to buy lab grown goods in fashion and even in bigger in, in bigger diamonds, it's just they tend to be able to afford the nicer stuff and they buy the nicer stuff. Um, and they feel like an earth mine diamond is the nicer thing. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, De Beers uh, launched their light box uh, several years ago. And one of the things they were touting was uh, the goods needed to be uh, sold as fashion. Lab grown, go lab grown goods are good for fashion jewelry, but they should not be in the, the engagement slash bridal market. Uh, we, we had talked to David uh, Prager that day and, uh, and, and told him we thought he was wrong. Our experience shows that he's wrong and that he's, he's, missing, he's missing an opportunity here. Um, and we have found that 90 to 95% of what we sell is exactly for that. It's for bridal, it's loose goods, it's engagement rings. It's, it's really not fashion. But what we found is a lot of these, a lot of these people who buy the, uh, ent the it's the, uh, the engagement ring, a lot of them, it's an entry level purchase and they actually uh, aspire to have an earth, to own an earth mine diamond or give an earth mine diamond later. And so a lot like Gary was talking about, maybe it's the Kia guy who is buying the lab grown diamond as the Kia, but still aspires to have the Mercedes Benz or the Porsche or the Bugatti. And so they're gonna move into, into the, the earth mine diamond. Um, and I would say that, uh, so, so we've seen 130% over the last year, even during the COVID year, 130% increase in lab grown diamond sales. Uh, last year, we experienced a 2000% increase in lab grown search on our website. And, um, and we know that most, most of these purchasers are driven by not the eco-friendly responsible sourcing. It's they're drawn to the 30 to 40% bigger diamond or saving 30 to 40 to 50% in their pocket. Uh, thank you, uh, Sean. Very, very interesting uh, uh, retail perspective. Uh, very useful for our uh, attendees. So Rob, we can continue with our panel and then we also we have a lot of uh, interested questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have some uh, great questions and comments that we'll get to. Uh, I guess right now I, I turn it back to you, uh, Blanco. Um, you want to talk a little bit about Gemological, gemological challenges and differentiation, natural and lab grown. Like, what are what are the big issues? Uh, yes, uh, I will be very short because we covered this a lot in a ten webinars. And again, who wants to spend uh, 12, 13 hours of your time? You can listen to all of them, or we have some special surprise for you. One hour movie at the end. You can watch only today and tomorrow. But we basically give answer in this book, Laboratory Grown Diamonds. Uh, I would just say, uh, from practical point of view. Problems are diamonds that are, of course, clean, and many of them, we can say maybe over 70, 75% diamonds are VS or higher clarity now. Uh, those who does not fluoresce at all, and some of them do not fluoresce, still uh, what we published 15 years ago, and now for 20 years that uh, air specialty grown diamonds uh, do fluoresce stronger on the short QV and phosphoresce. CVD is not always the case, and it's more tricky. So. We use cross polarized filters, we use microscope, and of course, uh, we will talk about this in April webinars, but we need to use portable advanced instruments that are going down with the price to $10,000, $5,000 to see the spectra of the stones. This is the final answer, and uh, Dusha and me are a great uh, supporter of using two, three different instruments, not only one, and that's why this is my short answer on this question. So what I would like to uh, say Rob now, if you don't mind, uh, thank you very much for great moderation and uh, we honor, we have you as a, as a moderator a second time as a panelist. You please stay for the answering questions because you also have some insight on the, some questions. Uh, I would like to uh, give a special uh, a guest, Antoinette Matlins, uh, who is uh, with us today. Uh, she's a professional gemologist and FGA like I am, uh, author of many books and she's a consumer advocate. And uh, it would be very, uh, very, uh, uh, important uh, uh, that uh, Antoinette, you show up uh, uh, on the screen uh, first, and then uh, please, uh, you, you do a lot of lectures uh, like I'm doing on different conferences, and uh, you are also uh, teaching to, uh, to consumers uh, on cruises and different, uh, you see them uh, across US. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, just to uh, tell uh, shortly to our attendees and panelists, what is your experience uh, with uh, 
consumers, what they're looking for when they're buying a diamond. Uh, so Antoinette, uh, your uh, panelist, uh, now you just need to uh, stop the video and open your, uh, so we can see you. Can you hear us, Antoinette? Yes, Antoinette is here. So you can start to talk and uh, in case we cannot see you, it's also okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. So right, because... what is your experience, Antoinette, with the consumers and what they're looking for uh, these days? I know it's different than 30 years ago and now, but please uh, try to do it within two minutes. The reality is that I have two distinctly, well, actually I have one market. Those who want diamonds yearn to have natural diamonds. However, if you're young and you're just starting out, very often you can't afford a natural diamond in the size or quality or beauty that you want. And so the lab created diamond becomes a very attractive alternative. It never replaces the dream, however, to have a diamond that is a genuine natural diamond. So I've had many clients who have acquired a, a lab create a lab grown diamond for the engagement ring on their first or fifth or tenth anniversary replace that engagement ring they remounted as a pendant or something else and acquire the naturally occurring diamond to replace it there is finish now it's fine oh I, I was just saying i have clients who postpone for lack of a better word the opportunity to have a genuine naturally occurring diamond versus a lab grown diamond or some other material for their engagement ring. I have never found anyone who was fascinated by the history of diamonds as engagement rings, which began in the 15th century, long before De Beers and, and the Roman times. I mean, the history of diamonds associated with special moments is historically one of the most significant of all of the gemstones. And here we have in modern history, people who, who are drawn to those same attractions, the brilliance, the durability, the passing on from generation to generation because they're less vulnerable to damage or destruction. And, and we can go on and on. But the reality is most people who want a diamond engagement ring want a diamond in their engagement ring. If they can't afford it, however, laboratory grown diamonds I have seen among my own clients is a very genuine and real uh, alternative, but it doesn't replace the dream of having the natural diamond at some point. And very often the first anniversary, the fifth anniversary, whatever the anniversary, their original lab created diamond is replaced with the real thing, the naturally occurring diamond. And then they take their original diamond, put it in a pendant or find another one to put in earrings, whatever. I believe there is a healthy market for both lab grown and natural, as long as the details are being accurately and honestly described to the prospective buyer. I think the, the, the value in the sense of what will the cost be 10 years from now? It's hard to know. Many, many more players may come into the field, in which case the prices will plummet, which is what we're actually seeing now. On the other hand, as various suppliers withdraw from that market, it may be that they go up or they stabilize. Why is lab-grown diamond any different from lab-grown rubies, sapphires, yeah. I think as an okay. we shouldn't go into this direction. It would be a very long uh, story, but uh, I agree with you. Uh, I think it's a good ending to say that both has uh, uh, their place oh, in the market. This is what exactly. Indusha thinks from the beginning. Uh, our first book in 2004 was uh, the only one. Nobody uh, was talking about this. It was a taboo. And then people now, uh, it's now become uh, almost mainstream. So 
Let's, uh, uh, Michael, uh, maybe wants to answer this question. Uh, where do you see HPHT versus CVD battle going? We covered this in the last webinar. Which one is better? A very common question I'm getting also from my customers. I see every every week more CVD than HPHT. HPHT is smaller, CVD larger. What is your experience, Michael? What is your opinion? Well, uh, we, we talked about uh, some battle before, which is the battle of natural versus lab-grown. There's the two, the two camps, which we see they should be unified one. Dan also said that very... Uh, very very well, and now another gap is uh, is coming up. It's that constructive battle HPHT versus CVD, from the product point of view. When when they are equal, why make a distinction? And of course, uh, in the in the past it used to be like that: small stones uh, HPHT, larger ones CVD. Meanwhile, of course the the uh, HPHT intrudes now into the bigger sizes. You, you, you get one and two characters easily out of uh, HPHT. Uh, so we, we, we see it quite pointless if the product is the same. And uh, I guess the price wise, uh, I know my clients uh, kind of uh, don't really care, but they like to call it CVD somehow, even if it's HPHT, I noticed that. I guess it's easier not to confuse with the HPHT enhanced natural diamonds, what will happen in the natural diamonds, so it's more like a clear cut. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Michael. Yeah. Uh, we have a, uh, one interesting question. Can I, uh, can I uh, yes. respond to that also? Yes. Uh, also? yes yeah, so um, from what I understand, uh, you know, HPHT is getting a lot better um, that the, 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 it's getting easier and cheaper to make the HPHT. A lot of them are made in China and the prices are going way, way down. So I think that's going to be, I mean, they're obviously a major part of the market. Um, CBD tends to be, um, have perhaps, you know, when we talk about the eco issues, uh, it tends to have a, a little bit of a lighter footprint than the HPHT. So that, that might be something. But um, I, th I mean, the people who, you know, you get all sorts of uh, different responses and that's part of the issue, you know, with the, with the kind of lack of transparency that uh, I think Dan talked about. But uh, from what I understand, HPHT is, is, is huge coming up in the market as far as, you know, there. Um, there's Barry Block, the consumer does not uh, question CVD or HPHT. I, I agree. I don't think they yes no but uh, um i think it's uh you know i, I think don't count hpc out i would say yes uh same comment from barry block who is a long time appraiser from new york or maybe 40 years uh, the consumer does not question cvd or hpc uh, and this is my experience as well uh, so there is a few questions uh, related uh, to the uh, we can say uh, one of them very uh, specific actually. Do you guys, uh, it's uh, Mehta, uh, do you guys think country of origin of lab grown diamonds will play a role choosing which stone to buy? Uh, I would just suggest, uh, I saw my screen this next webinar, uh, March 18, we talk about sustainable diamonds. And the idea behind this to track not only natural diamonds, but also laboratory grown where they are coming, uh, more like a chain of custody. Uh, I, Maybe somebody wants to answer that. Uh, uh, I know Dan or or, or uh, um, anybody from the panelists about is it important. Is it uh, coming from Diamond Foundry or Washington Diamonds or, or Indian producer or Chinese? The many many companies we we published ten actually uh, companies we in our book producers. We ask hundred ten allowed us to publish data. Hopefully next book we'll do up to fifty. Uh, and we have 20 producers from China in our book uh, that we put on manufacturers. Blanco, uh, I would say, I don't think it's an issue now, country of origin, but you know, for a long time, it wasn't an issue in the natural business and now it is, right? For when I started, people said, oh, it doesn't matter where they're grown. But yeah, it, um, I think that there's a general trend towards transparency, towards understanding where things come from, towards understanding the impact of things. And I think, country of origin is, is, is a part of that. And even if it's lab grown, I think it's going to make a difference because, you know, there's some uh, not yeah. so great countries out there. So if, if I'd I'm like to, oh, I'm sorry, Gary, go ahead. I'd, I'd like to speak to this also. Um, <clears throat> I, I am seeing suppliers now telling me which mines, which companies, where the diamonds are coming from, the natural diamonds. And this is, this is a result of lab grown diamonds. It's a result of the pressure. De Beers are working on, on storing, capturing carbon in the kimberlite that the diamonds came from. So in actual fact, 
what's happening is really good for transparency for the entire product. Thank you. And then you hear a comment. Yeah, I, I do. I do indeed. Uh, the, the, think about this logically for a moment. Um, the majority of, of, of stones, I'm talking about finished goods now, polished, be they CBD or, or whatever process, the, the, the lab-grown diamond is coming from China or it's coming, we know where they're coming from. The point is they're not really coming from the U.S. But I'll, I'll tell you this, people on this panel may not have an issue with getting rough uh, lab grown, but there are cutters, there are benchmen, there are designers that are having a real hard time getting rough lab grown diamonds, polar opposite for natural. And why is that? Well, it's clearly because there's different parts of the world that want to sell you the whole kit and caboodle so that they make more, right? Can you imagine what our margins would be if we'd cut our own here in the US, which some people are doing, some people on this panel. But if we're talking about the average small to mid-sized company, which is the majority, and we're talking even retailers, mom and pops still make up the largest amount of those. We need to do more US-based, but I have to stress one point quickly, if I may, we need an organization to help us because we're not getting it. And I'm not saying us as like I'm taking the sole responsibility of lab grown. Again, I see both sides, but the country of origin is important. But I would say it's important if we could at least import rough. Yes. Uh, may I, uh, may yes, I comment? Sure. This is yes, Antoinette. May I of comment? Course. Yes. All right. I think the most important thing is to communicate to the to the to the world that there are naturally occurring diamonds and there are lab created diamonds, whether they are CBD or HPHT, but that they are. Dis distinguishable. Not always does it require a major laboratory. Simple instruments can often tell you one from the other. I have recently heard on major network television programs that, quote, no one can tell the difference between lab grown and naturally grown. If we don't do something immediately to check, to, to, um, refute that deception, then it creates a significant problem in terms of the acceptance of lab created diamonds. There's nothing wrong with lab created diamonds as long as they are identified as lab created diamonds. It is also easy for the gemological community to tell the difference. Yes. I agree with you, Annette. I always surprised how little uh, dealers, wholesalers, and often retailers, and all people know about properties of diamonds. And the Diamonds Dealer Club in LA and New York, uh, or when I was teaching, they don't know if diamond has medium fluorescence or strong blue fluorescence that is natural diamond. Uh, we did talk about this pendulum for 15, 20 years. There were surprises. Nobody told us about this, but yes. we are talking about this for 15, 20 years. Anyway, uh, key is uh, uh, online education like this, uh, seminars and the future ones. And uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, to include uh, Sean as a retailer from Gina Barretto from New Zealand, a very big uh, supporter of our webinars. She's asking uh, one basically uh, about how both diamonds, natural and LGD, can show a better commitment with the environment. For clients, this is an important point. It would be amazing for us to hear from the retail perspective. And I would like to see if Sean uh, has some comments from his, when he's selling diamonds, if clients are asking about this uh, environmental impact uh, when they're buying diamond. And, and Blanco also, I should say that Sarah also has a question about, from Michael about reducing the carbon footprint of lab grown at, uh... So again, uh, about Sarah the, has a question. Uh, Sarah Ritchie has a question for Michael about reducing the uh, carbon footprint of lab. Products. Yes, you're right. In the same direction. Yeah. So Michael can also uh, comment, of course. Yeah. Um, as said, we are in the process of collecting data first. And we have some data. What we do, the first thing we can do, uh, you may challenge it or not, it's compensation. Uh, it's, it, it's for now, it's the best you can do. Uh, we compensate with a project, uh, a Swiss project that uh, installs uh, renewable energy, uh, mainly wind power in, in producer countries. Uh, of course, 
there's there's uh, better, there will be better ways, but we didn't find the single magic answers. Neither for diamonds, for mined diamonds, for uh, man-made diamonds, we didn't find it for cars yet. We are still debating whether electric cars are better than uh, ones with fossil fuels. It's a it's a journey. And it's a long journey, and uh, it's a step by step thing. So, but we're working on it. So, Sean. Um, regarding Gina's question, you know, we we have uh, plenty of customers who often or who off, also bring up the um, the environmental issues. You know, unfortunately, since we don't have uh, all the facts regarding exactly how you know the earth, you know, the mining uh, compares to the energy it takes for the reactors for the lab-grown goods, you know, we. We talk, we talk about the, the good things the diamond, the earth mine diamond uh, uh, sector does for the communities that, that within which they mine. And we talk about uh, the, uh, the obvious uh, benefit of, of not um, mining in order to uh, appease those who, who are uh, against that. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, we, without hard facts, we, we kind of stay away from trying to prove one way or the other. Um, and I, I agree with you, Gina, to be able to make a commitment, uh, and what would be really great. We just, we haven't found that we have enough information to be able to, to really, uh, push, push one way or the other and haven't made that commitment. Yeah. And I, I would, I would also add, I, I do think, and this is, uh, the seminar coming up, um, that the SES system certainly has potential. Um, to give a lot more information and a lot more assurance to clients because it does add something. So, Okay, we have two questions from John Pollard, uh, US. Uh, one is uh, regarding uh, pricing, what is important point, and it's a part of our uh, original uh, questions. And one regarding the uh, muddy low quality of CVD specimen due to strain interruptions, if uh, lapse to great transparency, uh, I can say right now, uh, nobody is, is talking about this in diamonds. Uh, it's more uh, become as a part of clarity thing. If it's very cloudy or very busy, uh, it's not as a transparency issue, but uh, maybe it will change. The other one is about most advanced producers currently sell their best output to their sectors, type 2A, flawless diamond, etc. Will tech someday reach the point where one carat LGD solitary DIF will cost $100? Uh, this is a question for retailers like Gary, and uh, I'm not I'm not for you, but for producers. But maybe you have idea about uh, this, uh, or, or any is welcome to join uh, and answer. I'd like to I'd like to speak um, about the first part of John's question. I think this holds true for natural and for lab grown diamonds. That all labs should change their practice, and they should honestly tell consumers whether or not diamonds are transparent. Um, transparency is a major issue, especially um, we're seeing more and more lower quality, cloudy, hazy diamonds in the natural world. Um, fluorescence causes haziness. It is possible to identify diamonds that are not going to be hazy that are fluorescent. And labs, I think, all have a responsibility to do this. They're not doing it. I think it's misleading consumers. I am frightened that one day um, there will be a class action against labs that grade diamonds as VS2 and SI1 that are cloudy and hazy because lots of unethical retailers sell them as beautiful diamonds, and it appalls me. Thank you, Gary. Uh, and second part about uh, if price will go down to $100, uh, difficult to say. I mean, uh, they're now going down a little bit, of course, but not like dramatically as Michael mentioned. So and any comments on pricing to... or, or, or the diamonds of your, your, your prediction basically for the lab grown? And that's exactly our concern. And, uh, and so for example, we've offered trade, you know, trade value, hundred percent of what you pay on an earth mine diamond towards anything else in the store. Um, we, we chose not to offer that same trade value uh, on lab-grown goods 
because of John's point exactly, not knowing where the lab grown market is gonna go. And yeah, can you get a, a D flawless for hundred bucks down the road? Um, that, that's exactly our concern about uh, the volatility of the, the lab grown market. May I add something here? Yes, uh, of uh, the $100 uh, stone is as long, not really possible as because the, the, the cutting cost will, will just exceed that. Uh, rough, uh, diamond rough will not be produced for that cheap. So I don't like to see the, the, the 100 line, unless there is something, some breakthrough thing in, in diamond cutting, but that would also make uh, natural diamonds cheaper, at least the, the smaller goods. So. I don't see the $100 uh, realistic in the coming years. Um, if I can add an extra point, um, I think that right now, very similar to the natural market, the lab grown market is in a race to the bottom. It's, you know, all the, all the, there's nothing really differentiating all the different kinds of diamonds, all the different, you know, sellers of diamonds. They're all basically, you look at their websites, they all have the same kind of thing. They all say the same kind of thing. Um, and what's really going to uh, differentiate them is uh, branding and uh, making yourself stand apart, whether it's with your sustainable practices or with, uh, with and I should say, uh, certified and genuine sustainable practices, not phony ones. But, you know, I think the idea is, you know, to get money, and this is obviously something that Swaps has been great at, you know, you need a brand, you need fashion, you need something that, that excites people. And um, if you're just kind of piggybacking off the natural market, I think in the end uh, that will end and I don't think that's sustainable long-term. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Rob, other panelists. Uh, I would like to wrap up with a few minutes of uh, what is upcoming and then we have another maybe uh, closing remarks from all panelists. We have two, three questions we didn't answer, but I'll keep it towards the end uh, so we can have some um, discussion at the end. So uh, we, basically wrap up our uh, topic of lab grown diamonds with this uh, webinar. Of course, we always cover natural, but uh, major issue is to uh, see how they relate to each other. The next one is sustainable diamonds. Uh, we have a, a host is uh, SCS Global Services. They're, right, they're doing very interesting uh, study on uh, sustainable diamonds. And we have Anne Mast, Angela Palmieri, Chris Ca uh, Casse, uh, Raphael de Bert, and Sue Rechner from uh, uh, point of uh, uh, geophysics uh, to manufacturers, producers, responsible council, lab down uh, council, and GKL talking about this topic. Please join us uh, in one week from now, in the morning, 7.30 a.m. Pacific time of LA, Vancouver. And then April 1st is a, a first of the geomological uh, kind of questions, sorry, uh, webinars, uh, seminars, this one is free. And then we are coming to the uh, another book, another uh, those who wants to learn more of the who wants to continue education with us uh, online, we have another uh, level. Uh, we started very easy with uh, John Chapman uh, uh, 10 days ago. Uh, principles how advanced instruments are working. John Chapman is making instruments. He also editor of uh, Material and German Jewelry Conference. He also wrote, editor of this next book, Diamonds, not only uh, lab grown, natural, treated, and laboratory grown. And you can watch this uh, one hour and a half on YouTube if you want, it's uh, one to be free. Then every week, uh, hopefully you can manage this, every week on Thursday is a day, you will listen either me on portable instruments or April 8th, Dushan Simic about uh, treatments of diamonds. Actually Dushan and myself started uh, around 2000 uh, to study HPHT diamonds, uh, this is how we get known, HPHT enhanced natural diamonds and diamond treatments, multi-step, and then we have went to into lab grown diamonds. So this is very interesting to talk about diamond treatments that are very common on the market. I'll talk about provenance of pink diamonds. So like, uh, you know, uh, Gary Holloway also selling uh, pink diamonds based on uh, provenance as additional uh, extra value to customers. So this is an interesting free lecture that I will do. And then we talk about diamond treatments from people who are doing it, like a Russian uh, scientist, Victor Vince. Uh, we'll talk about modern color enhancement. He also wrote a chapter for a book. We'll hear Chinese uh, uh, head of research, uh, Tejin Lu from NGTC laboratory talking about what's happening in China and a lot of things happening in China uh, uh, regarding production, of course, and India. We cover India, uh, but we'll cover China now as well. Uh, so a lot of things uh, in the book, of course, about Chinese producers. 
and uh, we're coming to now to advanced portable instruments. Uh, I'm using it. A lot of people on the, on the, on the panel, uh, uh, Marge Labs instruments like EXA, FTIR, portable, uh, 10 to $25,000 is still a reasonable price. And then we are going into more serious uh, advanced spectroscopy for those uh, laboratories, but also appraisers uh, who wants to learn more. Uh, they can uh, learn from the top, top experts like Dr. Zaitsev teaching about this in New York University. For $29, you can basically listen one and a half hour, Dr. Zaitsev about, for us, is, uh, his, uh, we're reading his book like, like a Bible of spectroscopy. And then our friend, Thomas Henschwag, we did a lot of research project together, me uh, Dushan, and he'll talk about uh, how to use advanced spectroscopy fluorescence imaging to detect lab grown, but also 3D diamonds. And our, our wrap up edition end of June, we are studying 50 to 100 stones, uh, case study each stone with a few instruments, and we'll be very happy to, to put them in a one uh, half hour webinar and prepare for the next fifth edition. All of these are part of the academy. You'll get a certificate if you, if you get five lectures or more, you can get a certain packages. We'll announce this uh, in April and you can get discount on the book. It will be ready uh, September, October, the book. And for those like Gary uh, probably can comment on how it was in uh, Cyprus or Antoinette Metlins, uh, Gary was speaker uh, at the conference in Cyprus. This is a conference five years, uh, uh, six years old now, started with George Spiromilus from my AGL uh, laboratory in Athens. We will also do it again in, in uh, Greece, in Thessaloniki. We have five workshops. Hopefully it will happen with the practical advanced gemology, diamonds and gemstones. So check please our website, uh, gemconference.com in April when we announce a final program. Hopefully we can travel. And this is what I can tell you uh, for those who didn't get the book, uh, please support our research uh, if you can. Uh, for those who have it, thank you for uh, ordering it and reading it. Uh, got great reviews from Antoinette, uh, from Renan Newman, uh, authors to IDEX to guide magazine i send you everybody uh, their review in the magazine and this is now final just this weekend uh, i know it's a lot to listen 10 to 15 hours of webinars uh, we kind of uh, me and Dushan went through the them and choose one hour and seven minutes of condensed version of this book not the whole book of course but four authors of the book co-authors are here plus our guests plus uh, producers plus the videos from the factory only today and tomorrow, if you go on a jewelry industry virtual fair website, the register, you can listen, uh, watch the video for free. And there's a link I prepared for you. It's here today and tomorrow. I will copy this link uh, for in your chat box, just in case you want to listen today. And then um, we will be, of course, offering this later for the fee for those who didn't have a chance to join this webinar. This is our thank you for coming uh, to join us. So now I want to stop sharing and uh, ask, uh, maybe uh, everybody some closing remarks and just maybe mention one question from Yoram that uh, it's kind of interesting, at least for me. Uh, does each of the growers has a own growing ingredients? Uh, and second one for the same person, why gray diamonds like naturals? Uh, I can tell you why 20 years ago, uh, me personally decided to, to grade in New York, uh, these diamonds because they have a color clarity, a value based on the, uh, these characteristics. Uh, light box has different philosophy. Everything is in the box, same price. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Uh, this is my opinion. Uh, I think we should separate them because uh, still uh, consumers want to know if they have a, a eye visible uh, uh, clarity diamonds or, or, or eye, eye clean. So this is my opinion on clarity. Of course, uh, you can mention as a closing remarks, what do you think about that and uh, about uh, anything what you want to say at the end and any of the panelists. If I, if I could jump in there, in defense to uh, to the major labs and even some of those that are not the, the major ones, I mean, there's some that, that guarantee results like GCAL, and then you've got IGA and AGS, et cetera. I think they're doing a really wonderful job of, of creating separation, but remember, they're grading them differently. The reports are different. One's digital for lab ground, one's paper, for, right? You see what's happening, right? These subtle different, different points of differentiation are reducing lab going just on price we are still in a price prison we've placed ourselves in that prison and we've locked the door we are basing our prices off of the lab grown community now off of rap sheet so if the demand for natural diamonds increases or decreases so too does our price of lab going as a community don't forget about market saturation don't forget about competition but don't forget your advantage because in color you win 
I use the reference of a red diamond. Show me a natural red diamond and set your price. But you can grow them incredibly so. Any remarks I, to you? I would like to thank Branko um, and Rob, but Branko, you have done a huge amount for gemologists. Um, Australians love you because you've taught us so many tricks that we can use with simple tools and simple techniques. Regarding grading lab-grown diamonds, um, I think Swarovski will take the lead, um, as Lightbox has also. And I think <clears throat> for the high-quality diamonds, there is no need for them to be graded if they can be sold with a brand. I think eventually what will happen is that the lower-quality stones will be the ones that will be getting certified, and the high-quality lab-grown diamonds will be being sold at premium prices by premium brands, and that will take away about one-third of the cost of a diamond because shipping it here, there, and everywhere and then paying for the fee for the grading report is just a waste of money. I just need to comment on that because I am talking to a lot of retailers and consumers are getting very, very savvy. They're buying diamonds online. They're expecting, uh, I can't say certification, a grading report. Let's just call it that. They're expecting a grading report, be it digital, whatever. But they're, they're becoming more savvy. And please remember this point. It's not just millennials, it's centennials. Their children are becoming, I mean, they were born with the cell phone in their hand. They're becoming quite proficient and they're, they're avid shoppers. But I'll just close with this point. If we as an industry can't make sense of this clutter and confusion and come together in unity, how in God's name are we expecting that to translate to retail and to consumers? And remember, diamonds were marketed to us very well, the best campaign possibly in the world, but so too could they go away and imagine the jewelry industry without diamonds. I can't, I don't know. Dan, you're absolutely right. But let me tell you, I have been in conferences where a lab-grown diamond producer has stood at the front of the conference to show a major 10 plus carat diamond of exceptional quality and said that there was no way to distinguish it from the natural. I then took that diamond, went under a table, pulled out my UV lamp, and under long wave, it showed no fluorescence. But under short wave, it showed intense fluorescence with a growth pattern that was so clear. Everybody in the room went under the table with me, well, not with me, individually, to see the reaction. So we have to not only think about what we're being told, we have to take steps as Bronco has done to make sure that what we are being told by the producers themselves are in fact gemologically accurate and correct. And in many cases, this has not been the case. And in many cases, a simple $75 long wave, short wave UV lamp is all you need to distinguish, or at least to know you need to do more testing. So, Branko, yeah. thank you. Yeah. But thank you, Antoinette. Uh, thank you for nice words uh, from uh, attendees about these webinars. Believe me, it's a lot of work for uh, Dushan and me uh, to choose the right speakers. I think we got the right uh, mix today. I'm very happy uh, that we get uh, from different opinions, uh, but not not too much controversial, but of course different because we have different experience, different uh, opinions. This is a, we just want to give a platform to people to, to bring their opinions. We don't say, we don't stand behind everybody. Of course, we just have our own idea that we should uh, uh, talk more about this uh, topic. So uh, we didn't finish. Uh, so uh, those who wants to learn more, uh, you, all of you who sign up today for webinar or wants to leave uh, uh, your email on the, website brancogem.com will be part of our newsletter and you will be informed about next one uh, we we uh, we need to continue this way until we be able to be open uh, i can't wait to travel again but uh, we'll see when it will happen so uh, uh thank you uh, rob first for uh, being thank moderator you, coming thank second you. time thank you uh, dan for big support from new york uh, marketing and gary of course uh, hope to see you some wine tour again. And uh, Michael, uh, I can't wait to come to Vienna or Vatnes again. Sheena, yes, I, I didn't meet you yet, Sean yet, but uh, uh, I'm sure I will come to some of your stores uh, when I come to New York and, and say hello and see what you are you are selling and doing. And uh, thank you all of you attendees. Uh, 
hope to see you in uh, two weeks from now uh, at some of the webinars. And bye-bye uh, to everybody. Uh, we are one and a half, as we promised, so we are all good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.